Uh, so we have uh, intros. So these and are going to be go a little something like this. Hit it. More in the vein of uh, kind of a mixture of original and best ofs with a little engineering done here or there. As yesterday, I was too busy passing out candy. Uh, each Halloween season, he graces our show. The anti-Michelle Obama, you go high, he hits low. His low hits aren't reserved to those scary in blue. If you're a radical neocon isolationist, you'll get his wrath too. He presents his last issue with bias he's not hiding as he asks his weekly question, who's the worst president ever, Joe Biden or Joe Biden? <laughs> Mr. Michael Carr, good morning to you. Good morning. <laughs> Larry Schultz, you're up next. First thing we do is kill all the lawyers, wrote one William Shakespeare, and those words are those are words that every jurist doctorate should fear. We've come a long way since Bill the Bar described those lines, and the penalty now for cruelty to attorneys is at least a couple hefty fines. But Larry Schultz, at this moment, it is those fears I seek to allay, because this Sunday, November 3, is National Love Your Lawyer Day. Did you know that? I did not. Yeah. That's great. Happy National Lawyer First Day. First Halloween, then this. <laughs> this is great. Uh, Jason, you're up now. Great. Uh, he's dedicated to all, even those who don't want his protection. But unlike Donald Trump, he's not running in this election. He serves up pizza, he makes the biscuits. Be you educated voters or barely tolerable nitwits. <laughs> so, no, <man>. so, <laughs> Bill gets that one. <laughs> so join me in one. Read that one again, Rob. <laughs> he, he serves a pizza. He makes the biscuits. Be you educated voters or barely tolerable nitwits. So join me in welcoming this guy back to the show because no matter the restaurant, Jason Barrett makes a lot of dough. Good morning, Jason. Good morning. <laughs> There's another, another national day of celebration we observe you should know, whether you call it a grinder, a hoagie, a sub, or a hero. This Sunday is National Sandwich Day, and hungry this does make me, as I topped off my mozzadella and gabagool sub with a sprinkle of aioli. I know one thing about my paisan David Valente, who's a stand-up fella. Whatever sandwich he makes will include some sopraset and mortadella. Morning, Davey. Good morning. You probably thought I forgot you were Italian, huh? Because Ferretti gets all the pub on it. Can't, you can't forget I'm Italian. No way, baby. You're in the club, along with Petrucci. Uh Billy, uh, Sunday we also celebrate National Cliché Day. So in honor, we observe some sayings that just won't go away. <laughs> <laughs> and while it may be better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all, unless you make that graffiti, and in that case, the writing's on the wall, you might be scared out of your wits, and made to feel like a dunce, but you can only truly be scared to death once. We'll keep on celebrating no matter what they say, because that's just the way it is at the end of the day. So to close up this cliche fest and make it still rhyme, I introduce you to the Admiral, who just like you, puts his pants on one leg at a time. I thought you were going to uh, uh, mention some of the missteps that I've had when the communication no, was. That would just be cruel, Bill. That would have been cruel, and I was, I was nervous. <laughs> I don't seek to do that. <laughs> It's all about it's, love. It's also a national be kind to your pet day, isn't it? That's why I was yeah. being yeah, asked yeah. to be. Goes that saying. Just remember, old I, Yeller died at the yeah, end. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take that, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not proud. Uh, Mr. Valente in the Ferrete seat, you lead off, sir. Yeah, so um, let's put on our pretend hats and let's fast forward to November 6th. We are sitting here in the remnants of a Kamala Harris victory in uh, on Tuesday. What is the future? Uh, what does the future of the Republican Party look like? Does MAGA continue or does the Republican Party pivot to what's next? So you're you are not saying she's going to win. You're saying and I have to do this for Mike Carl because the steam's coming out of his head right now. as we speak. <laughs> so you're saying just Presume a just for the sake of this discussion that it's a Kamala Harris victory. What happens to the Republican Party next, Mike Carl? <clears throat> I think it just consolidates it even further, and that's one of one of, that was going to be one of my talking points about that the Republican Party. It, you know, it's now mostly manifested as MAGA, but but it's that's very. There's a lot of overlap. Uh, I think it would just get. You know, stronger and, and and even more united. 
Bill? Yeah, I think the MAGA movement has taken over. I think that with J.D. Vance as the uh, uh, the vice president and probably the heir apparent, uh, that uh, and he's uh, and he's very much espouses the MAGA movement. I think the Republican Party that that we knew that I knew uh, 25, 30 years or so ago, uh, the Ronald Reagan Republican Party does not exist anymore. It is a MAGA uh, Donald Trump Republican Party for good or bad. Larry Schultz? Uh, I think that if um, Trump loses, we'll get the usual suspects. Lindsey Graham is the one who always comes to mind, who was all for Donald Trump, then all done after January 6th. Now he's all for him again. There's no reason to think that Lindsey Graham can't flip to the next set of deeply held personal beliefs because he doesn't deeply hold those beliefs. He just moves to whatever it is. So there'll be a lot of people who have supported Donald Trump unwaveringly or even more disturbingly supported him, then said, oh, no, no way, I'm all done, then came back, uh, who will not know where to go. Because if they lose this race, um, I don't see someone coming along who's going to be able uh, to recharge that, Uh, um, you know, even J.D. Vance, who was mentioned earlier, referred to Donald Trump some years ago as America's Hitler. Um, th- you know, while that may give him credit for, he may deserve credit for seeing the truth then, he doesn't say that anymore. So I, I don't necessarily see it causing a huge problem because a lot of people are willing to simply pretend it never happened and start over again. Um, I, I, you know, so I, it's going to be a problem because if he loses the, this will be, uh, two in a row and they will have, um, expended an awful lot of effort, time and, um, personal credibility supporting this guy. But I don't see this necessarily as a problem for some of the leading lights of the existing Republican party nationally. Mr. Barrett. Well, I expect it to, to do kind of what Mike Carl said. It's kind of consolidate. I, I think MAGA light uh, is is kind of what you what I would expect. Um, you know, I think it opens the field up uh, to a lot of people, not just J.D. Vance. But, you know, I think the Republican Party would really start uh, to look for a new set of leaders, um, some some of the energy you know, that's energetic, somebody that could connect the voters. And, and Donald Trump's really been able to, to connect with people that have, have felt like their vote didn't matter, that, that felt like that, that that they really couldn't have an influence and a say uh, in really what um, national politics or, or who would win the race or or any of that. I mean, Donald Trump has tapped into something. People viewed politicians in the past as all being the same, whether they're Republicans or Democrats. And I think what Trump has really been able to tap into is that people look at him differently than they do every other career politician or every other uh, person running for office. So I, I think the Republicans have to um, kind of stick with that and, and, and always look to uh, folks that are in the business world, and, and people in the industry, and not just the people that are that are politicians. Michael, you wanted another say. Yeah, I need to push back on something that uh, Bill said. Uh, Ronald Reagan was the agenda, the public policy agenda of Ronald Reagan is the same as, as Donald Trump's been, and that's why the the point that's been made about the the uh, consistency and the continued strength and strengthening of the Republican Party will be no matter what happens in this election. Yeah, I, Do you I, want to respond to Mr. Carl? I, Mr. I, I don't think the numbers uh, support that at all. There is so much of a difference between the two uh, on the international front, the economic front, the whole bit. Okay. That's, that's absolutely wrong. And I've, I think I've been a little closer to it than you have. And it and the, the public policy, both international and domestic, have been the same, and that's why uh, I support Trump, not because he's a pleasant guy. Can, can you point me to Ronald Reagan's stance on tariffs, for God's sake? Yeah. I mean, he never well, got up I there. I guarantee you Ronald Reagan used tariffs quietly sure. and subtly. We, we used them a little Trump, bit. To... to, to uh, 
gain advantages in international trade. I right. guarantee you. But Donald Trump's going to put tariffs on every single he, item he, that comes from overseas. Donald he Trump's, said it repeatedly. Donald Trump said that. that <clears> that's <throat> just part of his selling agenda. And okay, so I mean, he's a liar. Great. It. David, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead, David. It's complete bunk that, that uh, Reagan and, and Trump are linked. I mean, just look at the immigration issue. I mean, R Ronald Reagan was a, not an open borders guy by any stretch of the imagination, but far more per, uh, permissive when it came to the issue of immigration and the, the legislation that was en ended up being signed by the Reagan administration granting amnesty to um, immigrants to, uh, you know, allow them to get citizenship. That that alone tells you that Ronald Reagan was cut from a far different cloth than, than Donald Trump. Um, uh, you know, I, I the the free trade, the economy, the uh, you know, helping our friends when when they are they're attacked uh, internationally and not siding with the Russians. Uh, yeah, he worked with the Russians, but he always held the Russians' feet to the fire. The the strong stance he took towards Russia is what led to the the collapse of the uh, the Berlin Wall and and the collapse of the the Soviet bloc. He wouldn't be coddling uh, a guy like Vladimir Putin. He'd be holding his feet to the fire. That's that's Reagan. That's that's not Donald Trump though. Donald Trump is what benefits Donald Trump, and uh, you know how how does it make Donald Trump look good, and how can he grab as much power as possible? You're just talking about style and not substantive policy. No, no, no. What, what about the he, immigration is not substantive policy? The, 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 the border was was pr safe when Reagan was president, and we, we, we need you know we, we need a, a, a you know a refined, improved uh, border you know immigration in immigration policy. We need that, but the border was not open, wide open to criminals like under Reagan, like I it is like it is now. Yeah. I lived in New Mexico back in, in 1988 uh, at the end of Reagan's presidency. People were coming over. It, you know, it just wasn't a hot-button hot issue uh, to that level, and people were more accepting of the idea that people wanted to seek a better life, and that's what they were doing, not to, you know, not this demonization that we've seen over the last five years with the, the Trump, uh, or eight years with, with Donald Trump. We... we they were entering illegally. They were entering illegally. Of course they were. <laughs> yeah, sure they were. Of course yeah. they were. <laughs> <laughs> By yeah. the thousands. Yeah. The uh, Congressman Dent from Pennsylvania, ex Congressman Dent, has recently presented a the diff the difference between the Reagan administration, the Reagan government, and the Trump administration, and they're on on a host of issues: the immigration, the foreign relationships, the economics, the whole bit. He's methodically gone down and laid the distinction between the two. Well, I, I think it's important to realize that Donald Trump's not running against Ronald Reagan. Uh, if you look at where the National Democratic Party is now with Kamala Harris and Joe Biden and where they were with even Bill Clinton in the early 90s uh, is completely different. So, you know, I think it's it's unfair here to just take shots at Trump for not living up to the standard or, or uh, being the same as Ronald Reagan when we look at the other side and where that party has gone over the past decade or 20 years. You're going to have that when you try to suggest that there's no difference between their policies. Ronald Reagan, I paid pretty close attention in those years. He didn't have a hang Mike Pence policy. And he didn't have a shoot Liz Cheney <laughs> in the face policy. He didn't do that stuff at all. I didn't love the guy as president, but he did not in any way look like Donald Trump or act like Donald Trump or endorse the insane policies that Trump well, had. In Reagan's heard. defense, Liz Cheney was like nine during his administration. So wow. it would have been a terrible <laughs> policy. Well, it's, children. We're it's like okay to shoot her in the face when she's 49? <laughs> Certainly not I mean, at the age of nine, though. No. <laughs> it's just out of bounds. Now, uh, the, the, the fall with the premise here, David, and I find only one, is that on November the 6th, we'll have no idea who the president is. That's, but your premise <laughs> I, is a good one. Yeah, that's a, it's a good. I mean, that's a good guess. Is that we won't know anything for a couple of days after after November uh, five. But I, I think if Donald Trump loses a second time, that yes, you're going to see a consolidation of of MAGA people. 
but I think those those t- politicians who are very much transactional in their uh, political leaders, such as a Lindsey Graham, a lot of politicians doesn't matter what their political stripe are are very transactional in their allegiances. Um, I I think you're going to see a a float, and there will be a battle for the heart and soul of the Republican Party because Donald Trump will be, what, 83 uh, in 2028, and probably, I mean, stranger things have happened, uh, but probably won't be the the nominee of the Republican Party in 2028. So who is the new torchbearer of the Republican Party? And coming back from two straight electoral college defeats, the Republican Party is going to have to start to figure out how do they bring people in rather than tear people down, how to divide people into smaller and smaller groups. This isn't a, you know, uh, simply a problem for the Republican Party. The Democrats do it as well with, the, with their intersectionality type stuff that they do. Um, but the Republican Party has been far more of, uh, party has been far more of overt, especially within the Trump campaign of uh, singling out groups of voters for ridicule, um, whether it's Puerto Ricans, whether it's trans, whether it is, uh, you know, anybody within the LGBTQ community, the uh, people getting abortion or want abortion rights, there's been a ridicule of those people. And, you know, I hear J.D. Vance actually starting to talk about, well, we need to learn how to talk to women who have the, you know, who believe strongly in abortion but there hasn't been much action on that. So we, the Republican Party is going to have to learn how to talk to voters and not talk down to voters. And that's what's been going on in these campaigns that, uh, you know, the, the, the average voter is an idiot and, and, you know, if they're voting for the other side and the Harris campaign is doing the same thing, but learning how to talk to, to voters so that, that they're inspired to actually vote for a candidate. Um, the, the, Donald Trump won't be able to do that, but whoever whoever is next in line for the Republican Party has to be able to do that if the Republican Party ever wants to get over the hump of winning another national election. On that note, David, thank you for a good opening topic, a good discussion uh, here. You did well batting lead off here. It's key to establishing Thanks. momentum for the program. Like better than Aaron Judge. Got to <laughs> catch a fly ball better than, the, what was that, like a cat catching a marble is what that looked like. You have opposable <laughs> thumbs, use them. Move into hour number two of the program here. We welcome back our co-hosts for the Friday Five, David Valenti via telephone in the Joe Ferretti telephone seat. David, welcome back. Hey, good morning, everybody. Attorney at Law, Lawrence Schultz. Larry. Good morning. The Admiral Bill Stubblefield. Good morning. Senior member of our crew, Michael Carl. Good morning. And Senator Jason Barrett. Good morning. And now with issue number two of the Admiral. Rob, everybody's heard by now that during the Madison Square Garden Trump rally, a comedian by the name of Tony Hinchcliffe uh, made a joke that Puerto Rico was garbage, an island in the uh, ocean that was full of garbage. Uh, Trump did not denounce the joke. He said that he has not, uh, he does not know the comedian. Putting this a little bit in context, and we've all heard about October uh, uh, surprise. Uh, there's nearly one million Puerto Ricans living in swing states in the U.S. In Pennsylvania alone, 475,000. In North Carolina, 115,000. Georgia, 101,000. Arizona, 64,000. Wisconsin, 61,000. If you look at the Pennsylvania alone with 475,000, the margin of victory in, in uh, 2016 was 44,000 uh, for Trump. In 2020, the margin of victory was 80,000. Much, uh, uh, much, much smaller than the Puerto Rican population in Pennsylvania. Now, if you say only 30% of the population might have been leaning toward Trump, that's still 142,000. So my point in with all these numbers is, will that statement, the fact that it was not denounced, will that have any impact on the election in a very, very, very marginalized election where the number of different uh, number of uh, uh, voters that will make the difference is very, very, very small. Will it be an October surprise? David Valente, you go first. 
Well, or call us back and reestablish your connection. Jason Barrett, you go first. Sure. Uh, I don't think this is an October surprise. Um, you know, it, to have a shock comedian at a political rally is not smart campaigning. Um, I will say that. I, I think the, the joke is stupid. Um, I don't like racist jokes in the first place. Um, but at the end of the day, I mean, we need to stop being offended by everything. Um, this guy, this comedian, this is what he does. Um, if you've watched the roast of Tom Brady, the jokes that he told there were far more offensive than than that one of, of uh, the island of Puerto Rico. But it's a roast, so that's the setting for that's it. That's right. And, and so that's my point is that this is – but but nobody was offended by any of those things. And, and he took shots at, at Jewish people and, and – African American, he took shots at everybody in that. It's expected. This is what this guy does, which is why you don't bring him to a political rally uh, <laughs> in the first place. Um, but I, I don't think this in any way affects the outcome of the race at all. The Trump campaign's got to be smarter, not bring this guy there. But um, I, I, we're, we're, we in this country are offended by everything there is under the sun and we really should get away with that again it's a stupid joke and poor taste in the wrong location but uh, i don't think it's going to have any impact on the outcome of the election lawrence uh yeah i i tend to disagree with what jason was saying simply because first of all yeah trump didn't know the guy that's what he always says in these situations that was on a teleprompter his campaign was aware of what was going to be said and they sat right there and let it happen. I certainly agree that it was borderline insane to bring that kind of a loon onto a uh, onto a stage at a campaign rally in the closing days of a close race. Um, but I also want to push back on this notion that everybody's too sensitive. Suppose he had attacked wounded veterans. Suppose he had attacked other people, totally innocent, who've done good work all their lives, um, you know, maybe I don't, maybe I'm not, because I'm not a Puerto Rican, I'm not as offended as someone who is would be, but this is a former and wants to be future president of the United States putting that message out there uh, through his campaign. And we should be offended by that kind of nonsense. If that guy comes out on his own and says that stuff, you can just dismiss him and never listen to his comedy again. Unfortunately, he was given a microphone by a president of the United States who all of a sudden says, well, I, did, I don't really know him. And, and this is how it always goes with Mr. Trump. When he does something that's borderline insane, that offends a whole bunch of people, he then says he didn't know the guy. Well... I, you know, if he didn't know the guy, it's maybe because he's too um, cognitively impaired to review the uh, schedule of events at his own rallies. I don't know. But none of that is a good argument for making that guy president of the United States. Bill? Oh, sorry, Mike? Well, <clears throat> I, I I think there's a, a very little chance that that will, uh, you know, change the election or have an impact on on the election people people who um, are from uh, Puerto Rico or care about it or everybody else have a lot more issues than what some you know crazy uh, comedian says and and so I I, I don't think it it uh, it's going to have much of an impact at all and and I guarantee you it'll have far less impact than President Biden calling the Trump supporters garbage. How will that have an impact, Mike? Those people were already going to support Trump. That's right. Yeah. Uh, well, it'll it'll make sure that stuff like this doesn't take take away their support of Trump, and it'll 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 incent them to to vote and and to. Um, you know, if, if, even if they weren't, you know, going to waste their time to vote, there now they will vote if you're called garbage by the president of the United States. Joe Biden's not a comedian. That, that's a difference. Of, He's the, a president the, of the United the, the States. Setting president of the United States says that a certain voters, because of how they vote, is garbage, is different than some shock comedian who gets paid to tell jokes like that. 
Um, I, that's a huge difference. And so, you know, I think people that there are some undecided voters out there, there may not be a whole lot of them. Um, but when your president says you're garbage, if you vote a certain way, that has more of an impact. If this shock comedian would have made some joke about West Virginians, do we really think that would have changed the outcome in this state? So I really don't think that I would assume that it's going to, that a lot of uh, Puerto Ricans who uh, now live in the continental United States and have uh, a say on election day are, are really going to change their position based on a stupid joke from a shock comedian. Bill, you put your hand up. No, I was going to uh, go in David Valenti and then I'll come back. So. Uh, David, oh. we have your phone line reestablished. You sound yeah. pretty good. Sorry about that. Uh, so, uh, you know, politics is perception. And, and even though Donald Trump didn't actually say those words, a lot of what he has said in his campaign have been attacking members of the immigrant communities and uh, people who, who have come to the United States for a better life. Now, it also displays a, the, the rally displayed a lack of understanding that Puerto Rico is actually part of the United States, and, and these people are technically immigrants. They are American citizens that have come into other parts of the United States. But the, the problem is, you know, we, we, um, we, We've spent this entire campaign attacking and demonizing groups of people. Um, you know, yeah, Joe Biden said uh, the garbage comment about Trump voters. Um, there's, you know, I've, I've heard the explanations trying to explain it away. But remember, Donald Trump actually called the United States the garbage can of the world. And we're in the United States. So what does that make us? Just extrapolate that out a little bit. Um, uh, so, uh, you, you know, I, th I think. Is it going to be the October surprise? I don't know. I mean, we, we need, also need to talk about the impact of early voting because I heard a Trump voter who is Puerto Rican exp expressing a lot of regret that he voted for Donald Trump after that came out. So, you know, October surprises probably need to be in September now for them to have lasting impacts on the election because of early voting. We see that we've got a significant number of Berkeley County voters that are early voting. So, um, you know, Maybe for Trump's benefit that it didn't land or it landed late enough that that you know the early voters uh, won't be able to change their vote. But I do think that this is going to have an impact on on Donald Trump. That some of those voters that were the Puerto Rican voters that were voting on economic issues are going to say, "Do I trust this guy to have my interests at heart?" Um, you know, I, I I wouldn't if if he made a direct comment about me or, you know, how I live my life or where I'm from. He said that Italians were, you know, brought people on stage that said Italians were, you know, uh, all the derogatory terms that have been used for Italians over the years, then, I, yeah, I, I would probably not vote for that person. So, um, yeah, I, th I think this is going to impact him, especially in Pennsylvania, which I think is going to be the linchpin of, of the election. So, We'll, we'll see on, on Tuesday, but I, I think it was a very stupid, very un, very unforced error on, on their part, but it was very much on brand for how they've run this campaign. Comes back to you, Bill. Yeah, we can talk around and justify it any way you want to, but the bottom line is uh, it's a very, very close race. They're fighting for every vote they can get, and I think this was an unforced error, and I'm not – not inclined to dismiss the impact as readily as what some folks are. Many have uh, very readily dismissed it, as you would, uh, I think That's you right. just termed it right there. All right, issue number three for that, Jason Barrett. So three days before the election, uh, we look back and, and look at the choice for the vice presidential nominees. And obviously Donald Trump has picked J.D. Vance. Kamala Harris has picked Tim Walls. Do you think each of them made the correct choice? Uh, if so, how have they helped the ticket? If you think they've made uh, the poor choice, um, who do you think they should, not, not who do you think they should have picked, but, but how did that person they picked hurt the campaign? All right. Bill, I'm going to begin with you. Yeah, I think for the base, uh, both of them made a, a right choice. I think J.D. Vance plays very well to the Republican base. I think that uh, Waltz plays not quite as effective, but plays very well to the, uh, uh, to the uh, Democratic base. However, with that being said, 
I do not believe either one of them plays well to that important, critical middle faction. Uh, Waltz is probably less of an uh, impact one way or the other than what J.D. Vance is. J.D. Vance clearly is a throw the red meat out to the base and has made some unfortunate statements, I think, as far as the campaign goes, uh, trying to encourage folks to come over to the uh, to the Trump ticket, especially with his early statements with the cat ladies and the what he said the other day with the trans uh, population. Uh, I, I don't think those are appropriate comments to try to, as Jerry Mays used to say, to enlarge our tent. If anything, it's making the tent much more restrictive. Larry? Yes, the, um, to, to take up on what Bill said, um, it, you know, with J.D. Vance, you sort of get the idea um, that at some point, if Donald Trump wins this election, he's not going to care what all the people, the, the poorly educated that he always said that he loved, He's not going to love them anymore because they can't do anything for him. He won't be able to run again. So we're going to see a lot more of this if Donald Trump becomes president because he doesn't have any allegiances to anybody but himself. Even diehard Trump supporters know that's true. And so when this election is over, if Donald Trump is elected president, we're going to see more of this from both Vance uh, and Trump. That all said... The question is whether people are realizing that now with the Puerto Rican comments, with the other kinds of stuff that seems to come out on a weekly basis. Are people beginning to see that uh, not so much the vice presidential pick, but the entire ticket is not going to care about them after they win? And um, all that being said, um, um, I believe that Tim Waltz was an excellent choice, and I believe that, if need be, he'll make an excellent president. He's got the understanding of ordinary people that's required for this job. David Valente. Yeah, I, I, I didn't like J.D. Vance as a, as a pick uh, for Donald Trump. I, you know, I thought that, you know, I think he learned from his experience that you know, unless he got somebody who was who was super super uh, endorsement uh, endorsing Donald Trump that that he didn't want them on the ticket, but I think he could have reached uh, a little bit better to his mo- more non MAGA base. He's got his MAGA base. You never would have lost that if you reached to a non MAGA base. Then um, I think it would have solidified uh, his his candidacy. Um, as far as Walls goes, I, I don't mind the pick of Tim Walls as as the Harris's vice presidential pick, but I think it left a lot to be desired as far as you know, she she had the right premise in getting a Rust Belt state governor to be on her ticket. But I think she would have done much better to get Pennsylvania's governor on her ticket because Pennsylvania he's a very popular governor in Pennsylvania. That is the linchpin of this election. And it still would have pulled in, you know, states like Michigan and, and uh, Wisconsin into her column, which is enough for her to win. Um, uh, but I, I don't mind Walls. I, I don't, you know, like, uh, I think that he'll be a decent vice president, um, you know, handing out the mints at the state dinners and stuff like that. Uh, if he does need to become president, he does have executive experience. Uh, J.D. Vance, I'm, I, I don't trust the guy because he, he, you know, he's swung so wildly. I think he, you know, when I talked about transactional politicians, he appears to be one of the, the bigger transactional politicians going from someone who had vast uh, differences with Donald Trump to, you know, really just grabbing the torch and, and running the, the marathon with it. So um, I, I don't trust him. He doesn't have the executive experience that, you know, if, Donald Trump, who is the, the far older candidate at this point and, and having some signs of cognitive decline, uh, I don't trust that J.D. Vance will be able to be the, a good chief executive. Uh, there's just not the evidence there for that. So um, 
I think both candidates could have done better picking their vice presidential candidates, but I think Harris's pick was a little bit better than, than Trump's. Mike Carl. Well, I com- largely disagree with what we just heard. Uh, <laughs> I think I think J.D. Vance uh, was a good pick. He, he has a, a personal background, uh, you know, that reflects uh, uh, people that I think are, you know, important voters in the – in in this election uh and and i i think he you know a, a sharp guy and will would would do well if he you know becomes vice president or even later president uh, waltz on the other hand i mean i think is horrible and and i agree that the pennsylvania governor would have been a lot better uh for harris uh waltz uh you know with Early, early in the after he was announced, uh, they they exposed his lying about the, some important aspect of his military career, and even more significantly, talk about you know executive leadership, the way he uh, enabled and uh, and prevented the ending of the of the rioting in you know in in his main city in his home state. Uh, was it's just outrageous and shows what a what a you know horrible leader he is. Larry, you had a bit of a guffaw when Mike said something a moment ago. Care to elaborate? Uh, well, as you know from watching the show, that that's a fairly common <laughs> um, <laughs> response. Uh, you know, having me on a camera that I forget is on is perhaps <laughs> not uh, the best thing, uh, but. I I simply think that um, Tim Waltz is a guy who can go to any place in any town in this country and within a few minutes talking to people, they like him. Now, they may not like his policies and they may be lifelong Republicans, but he's a likable, um, relatable person. And I think that's very important in this day and age when we have people like J.D. Vance and Lindsey Graham, who one week, oh, I absolutely will have nothing to do with this ever again, and the next week are like trying to find a way to shine the guy's shoes. So um, Tim Waltz doesn't strike anybody that way as a, as a flipper on the most important issues of the day. Jason Barrett comes back to you. Well, I, I think that, like a lot of people, um, I wasn't overly thrilled by the J.D. Vance pick when he made it. Uh, but for me, watching the debate, and watching J.D. Vance's ability to articulate policy uh, in a way that everybody understands and is very clear and concise, far better than than Donald Trump does or anyone else in this race at this point. So I, I think Vance has really turned out to be a good pick. Uh, I when, when uh, Kamala Harris chose Tim Walls, I, I, I come back to David Valente's point is that. Pennsylvania very well may decide this race, and I think it will. And I don't think um, she can win Pennsylvania. And I, I think that she really should have put a lot of stock in that. Uh, I think picking a governor was the right thing to do uh, from the Rust Belt, as David said. But um, picking the goofy guy from Minnesota really uh, isn't the way. There are a lot of people that that are that I think uh, is like that are likable. Uh, that doesn't mean I want to be vice president of the United States. And, you know, I just think that Tim Walls has really brought nothing to the table uh, and encouraged any uh, moderate or any uh, swing voter or undecided voter uh, to Kamala Harris. I don't think he's been able to deliver that at all. You bring up some very good points there. And it's in watching the presidential debate and then the vice presidential debate. And vice presidents are, generally speaking, pretty inconsequential people. Once they take office, the the most important part of their tenure really is when they're picked. That's the highlight of their job. Sure. Because for the next four years, they're pretty much unknown, and and they should be. Give eulogies. Yeah. Yes, but, but, right, I know you're going to mention Al Gore to me here. No, I'm not. I will, but I've forgotten about Al. But when I, when I watched the vice, everybody else. When I watched the (laughs) vice presidential debate, it seemed like the parties had flipped the type of people that they had selected traditionally over the years. In the past, when you would watch a Republican debate a Democrat, the Democrat would almost always be more articulate. 
and the Republican would be the person who was kind of fumbling around the stage, low taxes, God, liberty, Fourth uh, of July kind of stuff, and the, and the Democrat would be citing chapter and verse of the Constitution without even saying, um, ah, uh, or pausing. This vice presidential debate flipped entirely in that J.D. Vance was the articulate person who actually did a very good job of becoming like more likable during the vice presidential debate. But then once he goes out in public, he goes right back to being offensive. I'm not sure why he has to do that because he, I thought, came off as a fairly affable guy during the vice presidential debate. And then Walls was the guy that looked like the former Republicans, the guy the Republicans used to put up there, right? Just kind of fumbling and bumbling around there during the course of the thing. I played for a lot of football coaches over the years, and I've interviewed a ton more. And I can say this with absolute certainty. There's not one I played for, and there's not one I've interviewed who I would say, that's going to be a president of the United States I want to follow. <laughs> it's just not, that, that's not a skill set that translates. It really isn't, honest to God. And I'm a, I'm a football coach myself, honestly. Uh, Vance really surprised me at the vice presidential debate. And there were a lot of very loyal Republicans who are who are Trump Republicans, Trumplicans, who really were not happy at all with the Vance selection. But that night, for whatever reason, he exceeded expectations and showed what his potential is. He ruins it when he goes back out in front of the base and starts throwing the red meat around again as well. Uh, ultimately, I guess what I'm saying here is I don't know that I would be happy with either one of these two ascending to the role of presidency, but at least... If it was Vance and he was on his better behavior, it wouldn't be like Leslie Nielsen in the state dinner on a naked on naked gun where he ends up offending England and rolling the queen down the table. And I have a fear that Walt would do that. Has, has everyone here forgotten that during the vice presidential debate, mm -hmm. J.D. Vance was asked who won the election? And, he and his response was, I'm going to focus on the future. Correct. Well, I've decided that the next time, and it, unfortunately driving a Route 9 every day, I, there, I've had some problems. The next time I get pulled over by the police and he, he says, uh, you know, why do you know why I stopped you? I, that's what I'm going to say. Sir, I'm focused on the future. <laughs> that's certainly not it, it the first a, time a candidate has ducked a question or dodged a question. About who won an election? It's, I think it's, it's, it is. Worse yeah. things than that. Routine. Yeah, hey, we're back with more. And at this point, Mr. Schultz is on the clock when we come back. Have uh, David Valente via telephone. Larry Schultz is in studio. Bill Stubblefield in studio. Mike Carl in studio. Jason Barrett is in for Mike Hornby, who is in for Mike Height. It's, and this uh, lead in introductory post. music is what? The Sting. <laughs> the Sting. And why is that? Why not? <laughs> did you see the movie? I did. A wonderful movie. It's a movie. great movie, yeah, yeah. yeah. Championship stuff there. Larry Schultz, you're on the clock. All right. Why on earth would any sane person vote to impose on others their personal moral view of what should happen when you have a terminal illness that is causing you daily agony? And why in the world are Republicans proposing that it is up to the government to make that decision? David Valente, let's go to the phone first. Hey, I'm from the government. We're here to help you. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I, uh, for me, uh, the right to self-determination is, is fundamental, and, and the government should not have a right to tell you how you should, one, live your life, as long as you're not hurting others doing so, and how you end your life, as long as you're not hurting others doing so. Um uh, the right to make choices with your with your life should be yours, and uh, you know, in consultation with with medical professionals, if if you so choose, uh, that's the way you want to to leave this earth. I have, you know, I, my family has a family history of uh, terminal cancer, and I've talked with my wife about it. But if you know things co go that route, that you know, I will be seeking, uh, you know, probably uh, going to a place like Oregon or California, which allow for such uh, uh, medical procedures to, to occur to, to do that. While I still have some semblance of a quality of life, uh, to, to force someone to wither on the vine and uh, be pumped full of chemicals just for the pure uh you know make them go to the last moment it it doesn't make sense now i i understand that there are plenty of questions about the you know influence and uh how 
you know, what kind of level of influence the you know, insurance companies may have over that. Uh, there are horror stories about Canada's uh, system where they, you know, recommend it to people who are just sad. Uh, but, you know, there are ways to combat that. There are ways to address that. Um, I think allowing for medically assisted uh, end of life care is, uh, you know, would actually allay some some of the issues when it comes to, to suicide because it allows you to uh, discuss your issues with the doctor and the doctor, I think, would need to have some kind of sign off on it that, yeah, this person is is ending their life because they're in a terminal position, uh, not because they, you know, they they have an acute uh, and transitory condition that can be addressed through medication or, or drugs uh, or, you know, counseling. There are ways to address it by driving it into an illegal state, which it is now here in, in West Virginia. You're you're leaving people alone and vulnerable. And, you know, it's great that we have numbers like 988 to address people who are having acute crises, but um, being able to discuss things with your medical professionals and getting help uh, is actually the right way to go about it. And by making a physician-assisted suicide, those discussions are, are harder to have with your medical professionals. So um, I am against uh, the, the amendment. Um, I think that it is an infringement on, on our rights, and while it won't do anything to actually legalize physician-assisted suicide in, in West Virginia, I think that it will, um, uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to put any more barriers to that, uh, that, abil- that medical procedure for people in the state. It should be noted that uh, physician-assisted suicide or whatever the terminology is that you want to use is not legal in West Virginia right now. This would make it yeah. uh, part of the Constitution, uh, by the way. Uh, uh, Bill, go right ahead next. Yeah, I did not realize until our earlier discussion with Jason that it was illegal in the state. Uh, with that being said, I am still against this amendment, uh, and I thought uh, uh, David presented um, a much more elegant argument than I could. Uh, We had this discussion with our Thursday morning breakfast table. And um, as I alluded earlier, we're the older, older generation. Uh, We did have some doctors among our midst. Uh, Everybody felt the same way that they, or they actually voted against the amendment. And for various reasons that we, uh, the fact that I don't think anyone is, would look forward to the last days being an uncontrollable pain or something, or there would be an intense co- uh, medically induced coma. Uh, I think the ads that are now going on in support of this, uh, that it's a burden, uh, will be a burden. Uh, one, there are very effective ads. And second, I think they would tell only a part, and I would argue a very small part of the story. Uh, we, we don't need the, uh, uh, again, it's uh, illegal in the state. Why do we codify it as being part of the Constitution? I voted against it, and I'd vote against it tomorrow. Michael Carl. Well, uh, I, th- I think it's just uh, the proposal is just a political stunt that somehow, you know, related to the anti-abortion movement and, and trying to make a, you know, some kind of a, overriding point uh and and it's it's just it 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 doesn't make sense and and i i was one of the old persons at <laughs> the breakfast meeting that voted voted against it uh, in our opinions jason barrett well i don't think that it was in any way a political stunt i mean this was uh house joint resolution 28 uh was pushed very strongly by pat mcgeehan who is one of the most pro-life individuals that you'll ever meet uh, and doesn't do things for political reasons. He does them because he genuinely believes them. And I think that there's been a lot of misconception, I'm not saying here today, but but a mischaracterization uh, on social media as to what this amendment actually does. Number one, it doesn't make anything that is currently legal illegal. 
uh, what some I'm going to just read here, if, if you'll indulge me, uh, just part of what that resolution says that, that ultimately became the amendment. Nothing prohibits the administration or prescription of medication for the purpose of alleviating pain or discomfort while the patient's condition follows its natural course. Nor does anything in this section prohibit the withholding or withdrawing of life-sustaining treatment. So really what this does is to protect the natural course. When, when someone's uh, coming to their, to their uh, final days or moments, that, this will, that will continue. What this prohibits um, is the legislature to come back and say, um, with 51% uh, of the or, or simple majority in both the House and the Senate and a, a signature from the governor, uh, that the likes of Jack Kevorkian can come operate in the state of West Virginia and convince old people that they are going to be a burden to their family and that the best way uh, for them and the best thing for them to do their family is to take their own life. Uh, in West Virginia, it's illegal to kill people. It's illegal to help someone kill themselves, and it's illegal for the government to kill people. And I think that is uh, three things that we should uh, continue to protect in West Virginia. All those things should be the law in West Virginia, and I have absolutely uh, no problem uh, making this part of the Constitution. So I would take that as a yes vote for Amendment yep. 1. Correct. All right. It comes back to you, Larry. Yes. There's a, there's a couple of things here that are troubling. We know from... I'm just reading the daily newspaper, let alone paying even closer attention or having people who are in it, that there are any number of systems in our state government. You might include highways, schools, child protective services, any number of other things that need remedies where we're near the bottom of the list. This isn't something like that. So what I would suggest to the legislators uh, is something that the aforementioned Tim Waltz might say. Why don't you mind your own damn business? Your business is to help the people who need the help in this state to make our state stronger. This isn't going to do that. Instead, what this is going to do is carry out one person's uh, moral view about this so that they can lock a door against anyone getting any relief. What effect, if any, will this have on... Um, removing life support. Nothing. I, I read that. Oh, well, it maybe. Says, <laughs> it says nothing, nor does anything in this section prohibit the withholding or withdrawing of life support treatment. It says okay. that very clear. So, and white. so you can assist them in dying by pulling the plug on their ventilator. That's a natural course. Having somebody on a ventilator is not a natural course. Okay, well... No kidding. But what they're going to do now is put people in a position where if, whether you like it or not, we're going to put you on that ventilator to begin with, whether you like it or not. This amendment doesn't change that. Um, this what, amendment doesn't do anything other than change the way in which uh, to, 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 to put this in the Constitution as opposed to general law. The only thing it does is to prevent a future legislature from coming in and changing this law themselves. That's all it does. Right. And so the individual who happens to disagree with this amendment and who happens to disagree with the government getting involved at all in those decisions has no freedom to act unless they can get two thirds uh, of the major of the of the House or Senate and Senate to uh, to do it and the signature of a governor. We don't need the government in this. There's lots of jobs the West Virginia legislature needs to do that they're not doing right now. So you don't think this should be illegal at all? You think the people should have the right to, to call up the, the likes of Jack Kevorkian? And no. Well, but Jack Kevorkian was a criminal in lots of states, 11 states, uh, 10 states in the District of Columbia now. <laughs> there's a process, there's a setup deal, and you can seek this recovery. It's not recovery. You know, There's no recovery. It, it's the end of the it's well. The end of the it's line. a recovery well, it's from the, the agony. Line. It's a, it's a, you don't seem to have an understanding of what some people are going through, and we don't need Pat McGeehan or anybody else in the West Virginia government that can't run its own business telling us how our lives ought to end. I'm just well, I, I, I I'm sorry to, to jump in on David Valente and sound too libertarian about this, but that's just ridiculous. <laughs> I, I don't think we should allow doctors to convince people that they're going to be a burden to people and stick a shot in their arm, and that's the end of it. Let me hear from David Valente, who, by the way, is a former libertarian. Go ahead. David. Okay. Yeah. So let's let's talk about this. Like, it's it's legal in some states to do this, and how much advertising do you see 
these you know doctors in these states uh, putting out in West Virginia to come to D.C. to get you know to to end your life. They're they're not reaching out to do this. People are coming to them to do this because they don't have this ability in West Virginia. It's it, you know it it doesn't make sense that you know it, you know we go to the worst case scenario, which was Jack Lorkin who who moved the ball on the debate, but you know we did unsavory tactics. The, the 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 problem here is we're you know we're allowing a bunch of a bunch of people in in Charleston West Virginia to make a decision on our ability to ma- make a change to this law in the future. We we may find that that uh, euthanasia is a, a far more and I do believe that it is a far more humane way to deal with the end of life than to pump people full of chemicals to artificially maintain them. To get to some arbitrary finish line that uh, you know we we feel good about legally and and for some people feel better about morally. I don't think that uh, you know I, I think that allowing people to make those choices at the end of their life, especially while they have more faculties to do so, is a far better, far more rational way to do it. I think this le- this led this amendment process that they're doing is just trying to tie our hands in the future because somebody feels uncomfortable about what other states are doing. And, uh, you know, I, I know Pat McGeehan. I've, I've met him a few times. I know that he's not putting this in, in there as some kind of stunt. I know that this is his heart, but his heart is not my heart. And his heart is not is not the heart of my dad, who I had to watch wither and die in excruciating pain because the meds that they gave him didn't touch his pain. That's that's what I'm. That's the heart that I'm advocating for. And on that note, we'll close down this and move on to issue number five. And for that, Michael Carl. Okay, it's a broad question. Uh, Is Joe Biden the worst president ever, or not? <laughs> Did he say broad or fraud? I didn't. Uh, do, do you agree that Harris's campaign is solely based on attacking Trump and is devoid of? <laughs> detailed policy agenda issues. So you've already pushed Biden out of the way. You've moved on to Harris now. Yeah, he's he's I, inconsequential. I'm coming back to Biden in my closing <laughs> statement. <laughs> Very nice. All right, Bill. Yeah, no, I do not agree with that premise at all, Mike, but you didn't expect me to. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, and I, I look at a lot of the so-called press conferences uh, that Trump has given recently. Uh, there are no questions been asked. There's a lot more. Uh, it's a it's an st- opportunity for him to make a statement, then he closes down the press conference. Actually, as far as questions from the press, uh, Harris in the last month has received a lot more than what Biden has. If you don't agree, Mike, go back and look. Uh, the uh, The other thing is that... Has uh, she answered any of them? Oh, yes, 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 she did. Uh, as far as policy, uh, uh, she has a stated policy on economy, certainly on abortion, which has been her, uh, her target, uh, also immigration. So she is not running away from the policy decisions. I think one thing that she's been subject to criticism, but yet I cannot, I give her some slack, is she got in this race so, so, so late, as we all knew. Most of, most of the time, someone has, ample, has months to vet their policy. She did not have this, so she was a little cautious initially while she formulated uh, a policy that that would hold water. And she's doing that more and more and more now. So I, I don't think her campaign has been devoid of policy. David Valente. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I agree with Bill where, where she was slow to, to really roll out the policies. But I think, you know, uh, uh, you know, the fundamental under, lack of understanding of what a vice president does uh, that we've seen displayed throughout this campaign uh, means that, she was preparing to run as a vice presidential candidate for months on end, and then all of a sudden is now the the you know it was telegraphed to a to an extent, but you know it was a matter of weeks rather than you know years that many tele- presidential candidates take to uh, ramp up their policies to address the emergent needs of uh, you know the current electorate. Um, uh, she she has done some 
substantive, but I do watch some of her rallies, and and they are really, you know, about the the what will be the cost of if, of reelecting uh, electing Donald Trump and and reinstalling him in office. Uh, but this is not uh, something that is, uh, you know, limited to that side. The the Republican. You know the the Donald Trump campaign uh, are absolutely devoid of, of policy issues, other than screaming about these people and that people, and and you know uh, insults and and calling people nasty and things like that. So n- neither uh, campaigns are running you know top notch campaigns at this point. But it uh, I I wouldn't characterize Harris as being completely without some substance. Jason Barrett. Well, I think that she had a burden put on her because of uh, the way that most uh, Americans view the economy and the direction of the country right now, that she had to come out from from under the policies of Joe Biden. And I think she was incredibly slow to do that. Uh, I think there's um, maybe in the past month or so she's um, fielding more questions from reporters uh, in the press. Uh, but that's only because her campaign was taking on so much water for not doing those things. Uh, I struggle watching her uh, to get anything substantive out of it. I think if she focused more on the actual policy and the substance of it and less on the accent in which she delivers it, uh, I think her campaign would be far more effective. Larry? Um, Yeah, I think she's doing a fine job of raising substantive policy issues, help for uh, first-time homeowners, all kinds of things designed to build up the middle class, which beginning with Ronald Reagan, has vanished in American life. It is a much smaller thing than it used to be, especially in places like West Virginia, because, at least in part, some of our legislators seem to spend their time trying to get involved in our personal business. Instead, they should be focused on making this a more healthy state. And she is directly saying what she will do to try and do that, including middle class tax cuts, which I'm not hearing. You know, tax cuts that always pay for themselves, that were always being uh, hyped about by the Republicans. I'm not hearing anybody saying that's a good idea. They think, uh, I don't know, maybe they do think they'll pay for themselves, maybe they don't when it's middle class people. But she's talked about those things. In the, mean t- in the meantime, Donald Trump is just blathering on about windmills and dead whales and all kinds of stuff that's just um it's not policy related i certainly hope it isn't um so yeah i don't think that's a particularly even close call she didn't have a long time to run this race but she has established some uh very important policy principles that she's going to go forward with mike comes back to you for your closing statement uh Send me a, a, a you know site to when she's talked about middle tax middle class tax cuts and and didn't include the fact that that's what Donald Trump did and that's why the economy and it grew and that and that's and that's why the tax revenues went up. There weren't middle class tax cuts. They weren't. There were absolutely the vast were. majority it of was the a, money it was across went the to board. billionaires. It was across the, the board. The vast majority of the money went that to billionaires. That is a lie. That it is did. an absolute lie. The, the, Look, the, the, a week the ago revenue, you told us Bill was lying and up. said you wouldn't vote for said you wouldn't vote for Trump if you were turned out to be wrong, and you did turn out to be wrong. No, I'm but right. You're still here. I, I'm right, and you're wrong. <laughs> no, you're <laughs> not, at all, not at all. As always, <laughs> as always. <laughs> all right, case closed. That's settled. <laughs> well done, gentlemen. Get your final uh, thoughts together next. As always, uh, eight seconds apiece there for those. We'll start uh, when we get back with David on the phone there. And final thoughts, David Valente, go. This weekend is the annual reminder that we need to end the farce of moving our clocks and move to permanent daylight savings time. Larry Schultz. Be a single wide dreamer in a double wide world. Mr. <laughs> Stumblefield. <laughs> Next week's discussion is going to be markedly different than this week's. And how, Mr. Carl. As a Trump supporter, I was uh, proud to be called a deplorable, and now I'm even prouder to be garbage According to the president. Time up in a hefty bag. Mr. Barrett. If you haven't voted, be sure to do that. Uh, my prediction for the Electoral College number is Donald Trump victory with 287 electoral votes. 
Dave Ramsey's show is coming up next. Gentlemen, good job. Colin, thank you. This is Talk Radio, WRN Martinsburg and TV 10, and we'll talk to you again in 70 short hours. It's 5 o'clock somewhere.